So we're a company of 20 years in the making, uh, 7,000 shareholders, the majority of which are individual mum and dad retail investors. I'm now, I think, the number five shareholder in the company, and I have also on top of that a significant number of performance shares waiting to be hopefully redeemed in the next couple of years. Biggest shareholder is uh, Bonafide from Switzerland, who invest in exclusive in aquaculture around the world. Um, we've had a journey of 20 years, and it's been very much up and down. This company started life, closing the life cycle of Southern Bluefin Tuna. It did it. No other organization in the world have done it before it did it. It didn't succeed commercially with this and moved across to Kingfish. It was doing very well in 28, 2012, when the fish began dying due to a, a problem with the feed. And the share price plunged from 150 million, the share market cap from 150 million down to just 7 million. The share price from circa $2 to 1 cent. It's been a journey of, of some excitement. The rebuilding of that organization since then has seen us return to the levels we were uh, 10 years ago, but at now double the mark, double the farm gates we were achieving in those days. My predecessor saved this company by discovering the problems with the fee, Dr. Craig Foster. The team that I brought in four years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, our job has been really transformation of the business fundamentals, investing in brands, uh, in marketing, transforming the names of the products and bringing in uh, the whole local story about the, um, the whole provenance of the Spencer Gulf. We built an entirely new executive team. We've replaced all but one on the board. We've grown the sales 56% in three years and lifted our pricing 25%. And all of that is possible because of the significant investment we've made in brands and in marketing. And today we have what we believe is arguably the best raw fish in the world. It's not just my hyperbole. We've won the best fish at the Australian Food Awards for the last three years. We were named primary producer of the year last year in South Australia. Last Friday night, we won the Agribusiness Export of the Year in South Australia, and we also won the Overall Exporter of the Year from South Australia. And in June this year, we achieved the accreditation for ASC, the gold standard for accreditation of sustainable and, and, uh, 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 and, and responsible aquaculture farming. It's all about the product. It's all about the culinary experience that our chefs get with our product. And we're on the menu of some of the top chefs around the world, from Gordon Ramsay in London, who did didn't tell us to F off, in fact, invites us to come into his kitchen and has us on his menu, loves the product, as do some of the top shop chefs. You'll recognize someone there, I've no doubt, Nobu, um, Sexy Fish in London, some fantastic chefs. They have our product on their menus. <laughs> Three years ago, we discovered a new freezing technology called liquid, liquid nitrogen freezing. This will get a product from the ambient to freezing temperature 10 times faster than any other freezing technology. And the faster you freeze, the smaller the icicles, the less sharp the icicles, the less damage to the product. And we then take it to minus 95 degrees in 90 minutes, and we store it in a supply chain of storage of minus 40, and we ship it around the world in minus 35 degrees. The markets we're about to go after in North America, where we have one market share point, is 10 times bigger than Australia, is 76% that currently buying frozen kingfish from Japan. And Asia is buying 80% of its kingfish from Japan in a frozen format. So we think this new discovery, which we discovered entirely by accident, I should point out, is, is, is a major strategic shift in the company's future. I'll just show you a quick video we put together with a chef called Sean, Sean Presland. Sean was the executive chef at Sake for 15 years. He was considered the, the most senior uh, sushi chef in Australia. He only bought fresh product, but when he saw this product, he liked it so much. So the last three years, well, last, last four years really, has been a journey of some significant growth. Uh, sales have been up, I said 56%. Our pricing, our farm gate pricing, globally is up um, 25%. It's that shift in the pricing that's allowed us to move our business from a, a $10 million loss the year I arrived to now some modest profits. And we're on a journey where profitability will stay relatively stable for a couple of years, but two or three years from now, we believe we're in the breakout period. Um, so last year, our sales volumes were up 13%. Our revenue was up 16%. Our underlying EBITDA was up 23%, and our cash flow from operations was up 73%. <clears throat> this first quarter, which we only announced about 15 minutes ago to the market, uh, volumes uh, and revenues are up 17% again on the same quarter of last year. It's been driven predominantly by our frozen product. Fresh volumes are up across the globe. They're only showing 2% up globally, though, because we've had a slight decline in fresh in Europe as we're now competing with land-based farms. 
but our growth in Europe and the frozen is up 125%. So our whole future in Europe is going to be driven by the frozen product. Uh, and you can see in there, you know, Europe's still up 21% overall. And North America is up 42%. Asia was down, but it was basically a timing of shipments for the period. We did a very significant global uh, research on this industry. We don't think this work's been done before. And a couple of things we discovered. One of them was that the per capita consumption of this product varies widely across developed countries. In Australia, it varies from 100 grams per capita in Sydney down to 25, 30 grams in Brisbane. Um, but in Europe, it's only 8 grams per capita. And that's partly because there's a lot of parochialism in Europe where they like their own white fish, but also there's a reasonable wild catch from the Mediterranean. If you contract that with Australia, it's 91 grams, and in North America, it's 63. But North America was 15 eight years ago, and the sushi revolution that swept through North America has increased that fourfold. It is that sushi revolution that we're now starting to see happening in Europe, and we believe that combined with the land-based farms uh, will start to see some significant growth there as well. We, we see the market in four corners. In Australia, we have an 88% market share, and it's nearly all frozen product. It's 92% uh, it's of, of all the kingfish sold is, is fresh. In Europe, we have a 42% market share. We had 63% until a year ago, and our business has grown. And that's the, adv the advent, the arrival of the land-based farms have added 800 tonnes to the industry, we've been selling about a thousand tons. They brought in eight hundred tons, and our volumes have grown, but our market share, of course, has dropped. These land-based farms are spending twenty million euros to get the first trunk of production, which is circa sort of four to five hundred tons a year. They're now out there trying to raise the next fifteen million to get the next half a million, five hundred uh, tons of production. But their pricing has started off at our seventeen euros, they're now down at ten euros. And that's the difference. When you've got the world's best product, it's very difficult to match us on, on a price. North America, it's, uh, it's, it's, it is indeed uh, a very significant market. We have less than 1%. It's 69% of the world market. We have only outside of Japan. We have one market share point, and it's 76% frozen. In Asia, 12% of the world market is outside of Japan. It's 80% frozen. So our strategy in frozen is what's driving our, is what's driving our product uh, strategy. We did a competitive analysis and we really came to the conclusion that for us, our strengths were all about the product. It's the provenance, it's the cold water. All our competitors in the world outside Australia farm in warm water. They grow in half the time it takes us and lower production costs, but the quality is not the same. We don't grow for six months a year. So from May to November, our fish eat and don't grow. They give nothing back. And this, this species eats twice as much feed for every kilo of, of fish it gives you than an Atlantic salmon or a barramundi, which is what makes it the most expensive fish in the world. But that cold water and that pause in the growth for six months a year is what firms up the muscles and the tone of the flesh and gives this beautiful quality. It's why it's, in fact, an Aston Martin and not a very nice 5 Series BMW. It is remarkably the best fish in the world. Um, this market's growing at 10% a year around the world. It's still an unknown species, and it's growing globally at 10% a year. It's the only species of fish in the world that I'm aware of where the, where the farm product sells at a premium to the wild catch and a significant premium. Um, for us, our expertise is 20 years of breeding, $40 million invested in breeding and hatchery facilities. The one thing all our competitors in the world want is our fingerlings. They want to combine with us to get access to our selective breeding, and the, fit, the breeding is where it all starts for us. Um, we have in-house processing now for the last two years. We've invested in this freezing technology. New team of executives, new board, long-standing breeding team. So we've not changed the breeding and farming group. We've just changed the commercial side of our business. An outstanding social license. Unlike many of our competitors in aquaculture around the world, we don't just have a positive social license. We have what I would describe as an actively positive social license, where the communities in which we operate are actually very, very important and part of our business, but delighted to have us there. It's a fantastic experience working in those places. There's about to be an EU free trade agreement, and I met recently with Senator Birmingham. I've been working with the team in Brussels. Um, they showcased us as one of the industries they wanted to bring before the negotiators for the EU as a company that had been investing in Europe and would continue to invest. We're optimistic there will be a deal in the next two years to make a big difference to us. It's a 15% cost in position we've got against all our competitors, including the Japanese who now have free trade agreement. <clears throat> and uh, finally, I guess, 
we, we have a very loyal group of 7,000 plus shareholders who've actually stood with this company through all these difficult times. <laughs> Our strategy going forward is in two parts. The next three years is all about now what we're calling scale activation. It's growing the business another 50%. And, and, and continuing with the programs we've been doing to grow the business globally into these new markets. It's about reducing our cost of production through bigger farms and automating the farms. And we're in, involved in a round of funding right now, which we'll talk about in a minute, but we believe after this round of funding, we will no longer need funding to grow this business in the future. And from 22 to 25, we're expanding, looking at a period where we hope to re-leverage really all the benefits of scale, where we will have production efficiencies and we'll be in a position, we believe, to deliver serious shareholder value. So this is our trajectory for the next uh, th six years of sales, between five and 6,000 tons in six years. <clears throat> this is a very important chart because this chart shows you the dark blue blocks are the operating cash flow from operations. And they were negative right through till we got to 2,000 tons. Now, the first bit of information you need to know is that every competitor in the world to us outside Japan is un currently under 600 tons, nowhere near the cash flow break-even. <clears throat> Excuse me. We reach cash flow break-even in FY17 and over 2,000 tons. The blue blocks are now our positive cash flow from operations the last couple of years. But the gray blocks going down are the additional funding we've needed each year to invest in future growth. Because it's a two-year grow-out, and we, last year we put in $11 million of cash for fish we wouldn't see for two years. So the pivot point in this organization comes in three more years at 4,000 tons, when suddenly the, the actual amount of the actual, whoops, sorry, gone back the wrong way, when suddenly the, um, the cash flow from operations is greater than the funding required to fund future growth. And then when you get out here to, to 6,000 tons, the cash flow from operations funds not only um, the future growth, but the capex, although we'll, we expect to continue funding capex through debt. So we are in the middle of a final round of equity. It's uh, raising. It's a convertible note that uh, we announced the stock exchange on the 15th of October. The um, record date is this coming Thursday, close of business. It's a convertible note offering an 8% annual interest, and it will have a discount of 8% uh, on conversion. There's a minimum price of 40 cents and a maximum price for $1.20 to protect the equity opportunities for the investors. And uh, shareholders are entitled to apply for more. I know of one shareholder already at about my level of holding, about $1.1, $1 $1.2 million, who's now asked to more than double their shareholding through additional securities in, in this particular vehicle. So, folks, that is pretty much the, the story. I've got one more chart to tell you, which is the summary of this company. It's been an interesting journey. It's been an up and down journey. But we've got a very strong sales momentum at the moment. We have profitable sales, uh, underlying profit with strong, with strong investment in the future. We've got positive cash flow from operations, excluding the future investment in, in the biomass. Uh, I should say every dollar we've raised from shareholders since I've been here has just gone to the biomass. We've been adding assets to the balance sheet. There's been no funding or losses. It's been completely future assets. We've got a very attractive supply and demand drivers. Unlike salmon, we're not driven by, the, um, by the, the world commodity pricing, we set our own pricing. We've got huge potential growth in North America and Asia. Uh, we've got opportunities to reduce our cost of production through automation, but also through genetics, where the salmon industry saw a 50% improvement in growth rates over five to 10 years, and we are now a couple of years into that program. We can triple our current production capacity through our leases, positive social license, and we are a sustainable eco-friendly product. And, and finally, if you haven't heard me say it before, it's arguably the rest raw fish in the world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any questions? <clears throat> Sir? <laughs> oh, I've got a truck outside. I'll uh, come on the back. Many, many places. Uh, if you look on our website, I think there's some listed there, but um, all the top restaurants will have it. You can serve it there, but the, the, fish, the fish markets obviously provide it. Uh, Paran, there's a Paran wet fish shop in Paran. There's one in the South Melbourne markets. There's a number of places you can buy it. You're probably better buying shares, though. It'll give you a much, much, much better aftertaste. <laughs> Adam. Uh, hi, I realize you got a pretty good like phrasing technology. Yes. And it seems like you mainly focus on the yellow tail kingfish. That's all we do. Yeah, I just wonder why you have such a good technology to get these fresh fruit, uh, fresh products to be frozen, and why don't to apply to other products or in you know, or well, they sort of probably go other mate or, or or other kind of fish in other markets. Well, we we are certainly open to other species, but we are 
we are the we are very good at this this kingfish in, uh, farming, and that's what we intend to stick with for the next couple of years. The freezing technology was discovered by mistake. I was in a restaurant in, in Venice and discovered that the product I was eating had been frozen two years earlier. And when I found out what they'd used, I, I actually rang the people in Melbourne, Adelaide, and had them knock down a warehouse we just spent three hundred thousand dollars on and hadn't quite finished. And we started again, and we put a minus forty degree warehouse in there. So I'm a b- real believer in, in, in what this has done for our product, um, and it's really now fit for purpose for the markets we're going after. And sorry, one more question is about uh, what well, your target market is. It going through these like a top restaurant, or you're also going to like a retailing? No, we're, we're avoiding retail right now, like the plague. Uh, I do not want to get into a you know dollar and cent discussion with the major retailers, but we are looking now at another ev- evolution in the next year where we'll use the freezing technology to move product into markets overseas, and then we will contract a highly specified product with our brands that will be reprocessed in market, we hope, and sold as a fresh product with a seven to 10 day shelf life. That's business transformational for us. Mm-hmm. And the idea of this is using this freezing technology to get it into the markets, thaw it out, reprocess it and sell it on. And at that point, we'll be talking to some of the top European retailers, certainly. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Hello? Anybody? Yeah. Um, but on the technology, I will hear. <laughs> Um, it, it's not patented, I take it? No, it's not patented. And in fact, it's been used for many years in high-value berries and fruits and vegetables. Okay. It's, it's not a particularly you know, innovative thing to use no. liquid nitrogen. It just is in seafood, that's all. I, I'm aware of it, yeah, actually. The, uh, the other thing, yeah, you virtually covered it. I was just going to say that because it's such a low-temperature technology and uh, most retail and supermarkets wouldn't have fridges like that, it'd be... Hard to crack them, but you understand where you're coming from. You we want do. to create a completely different channel. And, and to your question, if it was, how do you protect the product without owning the IP? The answer is it doesn't matter what the IP looks like. It doesn't matter what the freezing technology looks like. We are the only company starting with the world's best kingfish. And you finish with the world's best kingfish. You can put this technology in other products and it won't make it as good as ours. Anybody? Oh, cool. hey, um, you mentioned that you have a, uh, a six-month period where the fish are just growing. Just eating. Just eating. Yeah. Um, is that is that across the whole uh, feed stock, uh, the whole stock, or is it staggered? Or no, everything. N- n- nobody eats it's, when the when the water temperature drops below seventeen degrees. They just stop eating. Okay. So this freezing technology will hmm? help you. Stop growing, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> so this freezing technology also helps you with supply continuity, is that correct? Uh, it, it does lots of things. It actually helps us even out the bumps when you end up with too, mu- too much stock, for example. If something happens and you have a huge bump of growth season, you can, you can freeze the product. It's got two to three year shelf life. Um, but uh, when, when we've not brought this in to do that, but there's some of the benefits of it as well, certainly. Yeah, I, I can see that being a benefit moving into the US market, whoever – expectation of a consistency of supply as well? Well, we have this premium pricing because we are probably one of the most reliable and dependent supply chains in the world for any seafood. Four days from coming out the water, it's being eaten in all across Europe and North America. So the reason we attract this premium is because it's the quality is consistently the same, 52 weeks a year, and we deliver around the world 52 weeks a year. We go to most markets two or three times a week by air freight. So it's, uh, but we're now transforming that to give us, so we're moving from a four to five dollar a kilo air freight component to an eighty cents a kilo component in in frozen. Personally, no. Uh, the um, <clears throat> the fish the fish the fish are animals and they're obviously you know vulnerable to lots of diseases. But again, we have world's best practice more uh, survival rates. We're, we're currently back to fifteen percent, fifteen and a half percent mortalities for the whole of life. Very few species on a two year grow out can achieve that. Um, uh, during the feed crisis, they've got eighty percent mortalities. Sir, <clears throat> uh, just on that um, quarantine risk, are you insured against quarantine risk, um, or is somebody going? Is anybody prepared to take on the insurance? We don't try to. We do not try to to, to insure the live fish biomass. It, the, the cost of insuring that is just prohibitive. We never have done. But all I can say to you is that. Um, in 20 years, we've never had a material health problem except when we poisoned the fish ourselves with the wrong feed. And, and for that, that, that's now the subject of a $60 million litigation 
which will be hopefully concluding next year. And the other point about on-land fish farming, uh, I understand that in one Asian country uh, with the prawn farmers, the government had to step in and stop it because of the salt leaching into the water table. Well, I would never speak ill of my competitors. They can produce a reasonable quality kingfish through land-based farms. What they can't do is get rid of the taste that comes from all the chemicals that are in the water, all the things they're doing to keep the water fresh, and which is, which is why they start at 17 euros and end up at 10 euros trying to compete with us. All right. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, I just had a question. Is there a question there? Yeah, just about um, yeah the risks of disease and like you're saying about the feed problems, but yeah, just in terms of um, any diseases they could get, what are the risks there? The, the, they're animals. They're live animals. So there's always risk out there. I don't want to play this down. I don't want to appear to be glib. I, I, you know, forgive me, but I would. I, I'll repeat what I said before. In 20 years, the only material health issue we've had is when the feed turned out to not be what we were told it had, and it was deficient in, in an amino acid called taurine, and it slaughtered the fish. Um, they are susceptible to gill fluke and skin fluke. And we have, again, I think Will's best practice in the bathing of these fish. We use hydrogen peroxide, which breaks down to oxygen and water. And, uh, you know, it's very tricky. Uh, a competitor in Western Australia tried it a couple of years ago and, and cooked all the fish. She's doing it very well now. She, she doesn't do that, but it's easy to do. And we've done it, you know, in the early days as well. I think what you get with Clean Seas is 20 years and $200 million of shelters funds. That's got us to this point. We've learned a lot over those years. Yep. Great. Thanks. I've got one more. Sorry. Oh, one last question here. <clears throat> um, just, just in terms of that premium you're getting on the fish, I'm just wondering how much further you can push that price up um, in terms of the competing product, um, <clears throat> the differentiation, and how you're really conveying that to a broader market. Well, the premium we get is a 50% premium over the wild-caught fish. The premium we get in Europe is 30 to 40% to our, our land-based farmers. And, and some markets, are, some customers are trying their product. A large number come back to us after a period of time. We just will not drop our pricing. And we lost volume two years ago when I didn't drop our pricing, but it came back within a year to 18 months. I'm a bit like John F. Kennedy used to believe in, you know, voting early and voting often. We do price price increases early and we do them often and we'll do them every year about this time of the year just when the when the customers are getting really confused with christmas trade we drop a price increase in and it happens every year in australia now since i've been there it hadn't been one for four years before i arrived we do three to four percent sorry two to three percent this time every year and it just starts to keep the pricing going clearly in places like north america we recognize we're going with a price premium and we're going to have to be responsive to the markets okay thanks scott thank you